Welcome to this presentation. I invite you to think about the people who designed the built environment in early Leamington before 1837. That is over 200 years ago. They walked the sites with measuring sticks and tapes and then sat at their desks or easels to draw out their designs. With poetic license, I refer to this as the town's regency period but to be precise, that was just 10 years from 1811 to 1820. The development of the town after the interest in taking the waters grew from about 1800 was very much down to the major landowners, Bertie Greatheed to the northwest and Edward Wills to the east. Matthew Wise in the southwest appears to have been less driven to develop his land in the early years. The first two of these three men capitalised on some of their land by selling it off to others and some of these people became what in today's terms we would call property developers. When they began to build on their land to secure a profit from sale or income from letting, they needed help with street layout and building design. First and foremost, the leaders in design were often the builders themselves, but as time went by, some of these styled themselves as architects and others were actually trained as architects, either directly by the Royal Academy School in London and or by being attached to a trained architect for a period of time. It should be noted that architects only became established as a profession, that is, having a self-regulating body, in the mid-1830s, when the Institute of British Architects was established. It soon became royal, hence the present-day acronym RIBA. Soon, several other job titles began to surface in the property business, including surveyors, auctioneers and sales, sales agents, later estate agents. Of course, a lot of building design was inspired, that is probably the polite word, by what had gone before, and there were many pattern books widely available. I was kick-started with this part of my studies of architects by the unpublished paper on this period by Lyndon Cave, known to family and friends as Toby. This document is available for reference at Leamington Library. The old village of Leamington Priors was south of the river and no real development took place to the north of the river before 1808, except for Edward Wills's house and farm at Newbold Common and maybe one or two farmhouses. The colour coding of the streets on this map give an indication of when they were laid out. It shows the ancient north, south and east, west routes through the town in red. The village to the south of the river has streets shown in yellow. Later streets after about 1820 up to 1840 are in shades of green. They will be more unveiled in part two of my talks about architects. Toby Cave named several architects who appear to have been active before 1808, but their names have not yet been pinned to particular buildings. So the early buildings in the village in High Street, also known as London Road, Church Street and Bath Street, including that part now named Victoria Terrace, cannot be credited to a named architect. Cave reports that William Treadgold 
was working on designs for the main river bridge, which we now call Victoria Bridge, in 1783. It is, of course, so very frustrating that many early buildings, such as Abbot's Baths of 1786, cannot be identified with an architect. This map gives a slightly closer view of building in the central area of development, which is the subject of this talk. Of course, the major new extension leading northwards off Lillington Lane was the parade, known by various names over the years. The streets east-west across the parade were laid out by John Kempson, who went on to lay out several further streets to the west of the parade. The origins of Kempson are unknown, and he was a surveyor rather than a building designer, but his very careful attention to the levels and widths of the new streets have been in la of lasting benefit to the town. The first buildings on the parade were clustered on the west side. It is said that the very first house was on the northwest corner of the junction of the parade and Regent Street, now known as number 90, and a shop of mint velvet. The designer is unknown. As with many buildings in the town, the outward appearance has changed greatly with the addition of stucco embellishments, although usually the position of the window openings remains unchanged. A large building was erected along the south side of Regent Street to the west of the parade, which was called the Upper Assembly Room. This was one of several buildings designed by Charles Samuel Smith. Several sources say that he was from London, but he was certainly resident in Warwick for a number of years. He also designed the Regent Hotel, the Real Royal Pump Room, and Denby Villa. He was always fairly true to the classical style. From 1808, a terrace of 28 houses was built on the west side of the parade, south from the upper assembly room. Credit is given to the developer Richard Sardis from Warwick, his associates, and the builder William Treadgold for these buildings. Little is known about Sanders. Treadgold was one of a family of builders and probably had a big say in the designs. They may well have been based on second or third rate buildings described in the several London Buildings Act. All except the final one at the south end were two bay houses. The final one was three bay. The curving row which follows down to Dormer Place was built later. Three of the houses were soon occupied by the Vedford Hotel under the management of John Williams. A development to the south of the river was the Royal Assembly Rooms, later called the Parthenon, in Bath Street, designed by Samuel Beasley in 1818. In the 1820s, several architects were involved in developing the Quarry Fields area loosely based around Portland Street and Dale Street. They included T.C. Ballister, Samuel Beasley and Samuel Nicklin. Sadly, individual buildings have not yet been identified with an architect. In the 1820s, Henry Hakewell, a nationally well-known architect, and John Russell, a local architect, designed improvements to the Newbold Common House and Shrubland Hall, but little of their work was completed in the town except for some work on what was still the medieval parish church.
Peter Robinson designed Christchurch at the top of the parade in 1825, as well as many of the buildings around Beecham Square, now known as Christchurch Gardens. Robinson was also involved with several houses in Clarendon Square and the very large Copse Royal Hotel in High Street and Waterloo Place in Warwick Street. In 1827, John Nash and his partner James Morgan from London drew up several plans for the land of Wills and these established the pattern of streets from Clarendon Avenue to Binswood Avenue. They also drew plans for the area around Newbold Terrace. The plans for the Wills land were largely implemented under the watchful eyes of John George Jackson during the 1830s. Jackson had studied at the Royal Academy and was trained with Peter Robinson. Jackson lived at Strawberry Cottage, roughly on the site of what is now the Hitchman Fountain in Jefferson Gardens. This cottage was replaced by Newbold Lodge. It is a bit odd that this new home was designed by George Mayer, a travelling companion of Wills, rather than by Jackson himself. However, Jackson lived there. Jackson designed many buildings, including St Mary's Church in 1839 and both ends of Newbold Terrace around 1837. Edward Mitchell was a very versatile architect. He designed the RC Church in George Street in 1828 and in contrast, the gasworks and related buildings in Priory Street soon after. Joseph Bateman designed several buildings in the 1830s, including the hospital, later known as the Walford, and the new house of industry or workhouse in Court Street. He also designed the very grand East North Terrace, which was never completed and was entirely demolished very soon to build the railway stations. He also designed the temporary triumphal arches for a visit of Queen Adelaide. Towards the end of our period, the towering figure of William Thomas came to town. His family came from Wales, but he was born in Suffolk and the family moved to Gloucestershire to run a pub. He trained with Richard Tootin in Birmingham and became his partner, but Tootin died too soon and Thomas did not make a go of it in the city. He moved to our town and one of his first projects was the William Wesleyan Chapel in Portland Street now converted to homes. He famously went on to design Lansdowne Crescent and Lansdowne Circus and many other villas in different parts of the town. Like many, he was crippled by the Leamington Prize bank failure in 1837 as customers could not pay him and he could not find new work. He took his large family off to Toronto, Canada and there made a very successful career. We will finish with a man who had a fleeting impact on Leamington. He was Thomas Stedman Whitwell. Locally he designed a utopian development of Brunswick Street which he named Southville. A drawing of it was displayed at the Royal Academy but cannot now be located. He went on to design another utopia for Robert Owen of New Lanark fame in Harmony, Indiana in the United States. 
This utopia was also not completed. In the event, Whitwell built nothing in Leamington, but he had buildings in Coventry and Birmingham, which have now all been lost. <coughs> Sadly, he vanished into obscurity after the interior of a theatre he rebuilt in East London collapsed with several fatalities. He was not formally blamed for this, but it must have been a but he must have been affected both personally and professionally. This era ended with the collapse of the Leamington Prize Bank in 1837, which almost coincided with the accession of Queen Victoria to the throne on the 20th of June. I will end with a brief plug for some recent publications by the Leamington History Group. Full details can be found on our website, leamingtonhistory.co.uk.